The butterfly method of venipuncture is also called the winged infusion method. This is because a winged infusion set is used to collect the specimen. The term butterfly is derived from the plastic wings located between the needle and tubing of the winged infusion set. The butterfly method for performing a venipuncture is used for difficult draws, such as when a vein is small or sclerosed. The medical assistant will show you how to collect venous blood using the butterfly method. The specimens will be transported to an outside laboratory for testing. First, sanitize your hands. Greet the patient and introduce yourself. Identify the patient by asking the patient to state his or her full name and date of birth. Compare this information with the data in the patient's chart. If you are employed at a medical office that uses an electronic medical record, compare this information with the demographic data indicated in the patient's electronic record. If the patient was required to prepare for the test, check to make sure she has prepared properly. If the patient has not followed the patient preparation requirements, notify the physician for instructions on handling the situation. Assemble your equipment. To perform this procedure, you need a winged infusion set with a 1 half to 3 quarter inch needle with a gauge between 21 to 23. You also need a plastic holder, tourniquet, antiseptic wipe, sterile gauze, adhesive bandage, and a laboratory request form. Select the proper evacuated tubes for the tests ordered by the physician. The physician has ordered a CBC, a basic metabolic profile, and a renal function profile. The laboratory directory indicates that you need a lavender tube and two serum separator tubes. Check the expiration date of the tubes. Outdated tubes may no longer contain a vacuum and as a result could not draw blood into the tube. Label each tube with the patient's name and date of birth, the date, and your initials. Since the specimens are to be tested at an outside laboratory, complete a laboratory request form. Next, you must prepare the winged infusion set. Remove it from its package and extend the tubing to its full length. Stretch the tubing slightly to prevent it from coiling back up. This permits a free flow of blood in the tubing. Insert the posterior needle into the small opening on the plastic holder. Screw the plastic holder onto the lure adapter and tighten it securely. Open the sterile gauze pack and lie it flat to allow the gauze pad to rest on the inside of its wrapper. Position the evacuated tubes in the correct order of draw. The serum separator tubes must be drawn first, followed by the lavender tube. Pick up the first serum separator tube and place it loosely in the plastic holder. Explain the procedure to the patient and offer reassurance to reduce fear or apprehension. Perform a preliminary assessment of both arms to determine the best vein to use. Ask the patient which arm has been used in the past to obtain blood. Apply the tourniquet three to four inches above the bend in the elbow. Make sure the tourniquet lies flat against the patient's skin and does not pinch the skin. It should be snug, but not tight. Ask the patient to clench her fist. The combined effect of the tourniquet and the clenched fist causes the antecubital veins to stand out. This makes the veins easier to palpate. With a tourniquet in place, thoroughly assess the veins of first one arm and then the other to determine the best vein to use. Position the patient's arm to allow for easy access to the antecubital veins. Extend the arm in a straight line from the shoulder to the wrist with the antecubital veins facing you. Support the arm on an armrest, a rolled towel, or by having the patient place the fist of the other hand under the elbow. Thoroughly and gently palpate the selected vein with the fingertips to determine the direction of the vein and to estimate its size and depth. Remove the tourniquet. Never leave the tourniquet on for more than one minute at a time, as this is uncomfortable and may alter test results. Wait at least two minutes before reapplying the tourniquet. 
Cleanse the puncture site with an antiseptic wipe, moving in a circular motion, starting from the inside and moving away from the puncture site. Allow the site to air dry. This gives the alcohol enough time to destroy the microorganisms on the skin and prevents the patient from experiencing a stinging sensation when the puncture is made. Drying also prevents wet alcohol from entering the blood specimen. This results in hemolysis of the blood specimen, leading to inaccurate test results. Do not touch the area, wipe the area with gauze, or fan the area with your hand. This causes contamination of the puncture site, and the cleansing process must be repeated. Place your supplies within comfortable reach. Reapply the tourniquet and put on your gloves while the site is drying. Pick up the winged infusion set with your dominant hand. Press the butterfly tips together. Remove the protective sheath from the needle of the infusion set. Position the needle with the bevel facing up. This allows easier entry into the skin and the vein, resulting in less pain for the patient. To anchor the vein, grasp the patient's arm with your non-dominant hand and place your thumb to the side of the puncture site. This position keeps your thumb out of the way of the winged infusion setup so you can maintain a 15 degree angle when entering the vein. Use your thumb to draw the skin taut over the vein. This makes it easier to penetrate the patient's skin. Position the needle at a 15 degree angle to the patient's arm while resting your fingers on the patient's forearm. Ensure that the needle points in the same direction as the vein to be entered. Position the needle so that it enters the vein approximately one eighth inch below the place where the vein is to be entered. Tell the patient that she will feel a small stick, using one continuous steady motion to enter the skin and then the vein. Using a continuous motion helps to reduce tissue damage. You will feel a sensation of resistance followed by a release as the vein is entered. After penetrating the vein, decrease the angle of the needle to 5 degrees. If the needle is in the vein, a flash of blood will appear at the top of the tubing. Thread the needle forward an additional one-fourth of an inch inside the center of the vein. This prevents the needle from coming out of the vein. This is known as seating the needle. Seating the needle lets you use both hands for changing tubes. Spread open the butterfly wings and securely rest them flat against the skin. Pick up the holder and tube, keeping them in a downward position. This allows the tube to fill from the bottom up and not near the rubber stopper, which prevents venous reflux. Position the label so that it faces down so you can observe the blood as it fills the tube. Slowly push the tube forward to the end of the holder. This causes the posterior needle to puncture the rubber stopper. If the needle is in the vein, blood will begin flowing through the tubing and into the evacuated tube. The suction of the evacuated tube automatically draws the blood into the tube. Allow the tube to fill until there is no more vacuum, indicated by the cessation of blood flow into the tube. Do not remove the tube before the vacuum is exhausted. If you do, a rush of air could enter the tube and damage the red blood cells, leading to inaccurate test results. Also, a tube containing an additive must be filled completely to ensure the correct ratio between the additive and the blood specimen. Pull the tube off the posterior needle. If the tube contains a clot activator, Gently invert the tube back and forth five times before laying it down. Carefully insert the second serum separator tube into the plastic holder and push it forward to the end of the holder. Allow the tube to fill to the exhaustion of the vacuum. Pull the tube off the posterior needle. If the tube contains a clot activator, Gently invert the tube back and forth five times before laying it down. Insert the last tube into the plastic holder and push it forward to the end of the holder. Remove the tension from the tourniquet by pulling upward on one of the flaps of the tourniquet. Ask the patient to unclench her fist. The tension must be removed before the needle. Otherwise, 
The pressure on the vein from the tourniquet and the fist could cause internal and external bleeding around the puncture site. After the vacuum has been exhausted, remove the last tube from the holder. Removing the last tube prevents blood from dripping out of the tip of the needle after it is removed from the patient's arm. Since lavender tubes contain an anticoagulant, gently invert the tube back and forth eight to ten times before laying it down. A tube containing an anticoagulant must be inverted immediately after drawing it to prevent the blood specimen from clotting. Careful mixing of the blood with the anticoagulant prevents hemolysis. Place a sterile gauze pad slightly above the puncture site. The gauze stabilizes the skin as the needle is removed. This prevents tissue movement and patient discomfort as the needle is removed. Grasp the setup just below the wings and slowly withdraw the needle at the same angle as that for penetration. Using the same angle reduces tissue damage. Immediately move the gauze over the puncture site and apply firm pressure to stop bleeding. Do not apply pressure to the puncture site until the needle is completely removed. Cooperative patients can be asked to assist by applying pressure with the gauze pad. To activate the safety shield, grasp the base of the shield with your thumb and index finger of one hand and grasp either wing with your other hand. Slide the wing back into the rear slot of the safety shield until you hear an audible click indicating the shield has locked into place. Immediately discard the entire setup by first dropping the needle into a biohazard sharps container followed by the tubing and holder. The OSHA standard requires immediate disposal of the entire setup to prevent a needle stick injury. OSHA does not permit the removal of the needle from the holder. Removing the holder exposes the sheath-covered posterior needle, which could result in a needle stick injury. In addition, the holder is often contaminated with blood and must not be reused. To make sure you understand this procedure, the venipuncture will be performed again without pausing, starting with penetration of the patient's vein. You must continue to apply pressure for one to two minutes with the gauze pad to reduce the leakage of blood from the puncture site externally or internally. The arm can be elevated to facilitate clot formation. Do not allow the patient to bend the arm at the elbow because this increases blood loss from the puncture site. Stay with the patient until the bleeding has stopped. Remove the gauze and inspect the puncture site to ensure that the opening is sealed with a clot. Apply an adhesive bandage to the puncture site. As an alternative, the gauze pad can be folded into quarters and taped on the puncture site to be used as a pressure bandage. Instruct the patient not to pick up anything heavy for about an hour. Lifting a heavy object causes pressure on the puncture site, which could result in bleeding. Remove your gloves and sanitize your hands. Chart the procedure. Include the date and time, which arm and vein were used, and any unusual patient reactions. If you are employed at a medical office that uses an electronic medical record, chart the procedure by entering the appropriate data into the computer. Transport the tubes to an office laboratory work area. Without touching the tube stoppers, 
place the serum separator tubes in a test tube rack. Allow them to stand in an upright position for 30 to 45 minutes for clot formation to occur. The serum separator tubes must be processed further before they are sent to an outside laboratory. Apply gloves and place the serum separator tubes in a centrifuge. Centrifuge the tubes for 10 to 15 minutes. Prepare the specimens for transport to an outside laboratory for testing according to the medical office policy. Place the serum separator tubes and the lavender tube in a biohazard specimen bag. Remove your gloves and insert the laboratory request in the outside pocket of the specimen bag. File a copy of the lab request in the patient's chart. Sanitize your hands and chart the date the specimen was transported to the laboratory in the patient's record. If you are employed at a medical office that uses an electronic medical record, chart the specimen transportation information by entering the appropriate data into the computer. Store the tubes as specified in the laboratory directory until they are picked up by the laboratory courier.